Art and science are often depicted as polar opposites. But the truth is these areas of study are far more connected than many of us might imagine. Consider how one of the world's premier museums, the Art Institute of Chicago, is reaching out to Northwestern scientists to solve mysteries from its collection. Francesca Casadillo is always prepared to answer this question. What's a nice scientist like her doing in a museum of art? To me what is really exciting and fascinating is that we're writing a new page of art history. For Casadillo, the new page in art history is about building a bridge between two disciplines, using science as a way to understand the full story behind pieces of art. Casadillo is a conservation scientist, and in 2003, she left her native Italy to come to the Art Institute of Chicago. The Art Institute received a large gift from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to establish a scientific laboratory, but right from the start there was a mandate to um, establish connections with other researchers and scientists in the Chicago area to expand our opportunities to do in-depth research on the collection. Casadillo decided to build on a budding relationship between the Institute and Northwestern University in particular with the Department of Material Sciences at Northwestern's McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science. We are problem solvers at heart, bottom line. This brought a whole new set of problems to us. That is looking at the past, trying to figure out how something was made. One of the first mysteries to solve was a sculpture, simply titled The Kneeling Figure. Nothing quite like it had ever been seen anywhere else. Its origins were unknown. The figure is clearly kneeling with his uh, back taut, his hands bound behind him with some type of a thick rope. His eyes, you can see, are blank. This figure, we assume to be male, is clearly anticipating some type of a terrifying punishment. Then, in 2001, a discovery. Some sculptures, believed to be approximately 2,000 years old, were discovered in southeastern China. In some ways, they looked remarkably similar to the kneeling figure, but their color and possible material composition appeared to be different. The question was why? Under careful supervision, the kneeling figure was brought to Catherine Faber's material science lab at Northwestern. So what we had to do was, first of all, establish the chemical composition. What mineral is the kneeling figure? And we did that by using x-ray diffraction. And from that, we determined that the kneeling figure is made of a mineral known as chlorite. The next questions, why was the figure black? Was the dark color an indication the piece had been burned, perhaps in an ancient ceremony? Faber confirmed that possibility by heating samples of chlorite. So from this heating experiment, we were able to establish that if a piece of chlorite were taken to about 500 degrees centigrade, which can easily be reached in a wood fire, the color can change to a uh, dark, almost black appearance. I think it's part of detective story, it's part of forensic science. You might say an ongoing investigation. But it was not the only one. In another part of the museum, questions were stirring about a famous work by Winslow Homer. The piece, an 1887 watercolor called For to be a Farmer's Boy. Homer is really known for um, the dramatic skies in his landscapes. So to see a work like this, which in fact was painted on Prout's Neck in Maine near his house, with a completely empty sky raises an obvious question, which is why an empty sky? The first step, to put the watercolor under a microscope. At low magnification, I wasn't finding anything, but then when I zoomed in to about 25 or 30 times a normal magnification, I actually could see pigment particles. And this told me that it is a finished piece. This was actually painted in washes of yellow and pink, and the area in the sky um, was originally orange. Good deduction, but the Art Institute wanted harder data. Francesca Casadillo removed some pigment, a tiny amount invisible to the naked eye. The challenge was to remove a minimal amount and preserve the art. The sample was about 10 grains, 10 pigment grains. Each had a diameter of about 100 microns, so that's a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. 
and that's all the sample you're given, and you're told that there will be no more sample. Postdoctoral fellow Krista Brousseau and chemistry professor Richard Van Dyne work with Raman spectroscopy, a method of examining the vibrations of molecules to determine the precise composition of a substance. The problem, materials like paint, are often blended and hard to identify. In the 1970s, Van Dyne pioneered a method in spectroscopy that could help scientists hone in on exactly what they're looking for. Imagine a, a, a child in a sandbox with some toys, and the toys are the molecules that we want to study, and they're, they're hidden under the sand, and you can't see them. So our technique got rid of the sand so you could see the toys what? and identify what they are. The spectroscopy showed the sky pigments Homer used were vulnerable to light exposure. While the Art Institute did not consider restoring the sky to the painting, one doesn't want to interfere or intervene that much so to the point where you're obscuring what, what, what the artist did. The museum did develop a digital recreation. In this rendering, watch the sky to get a sense of how the painting might have appeared originally. In this case, science helped reveal art. Coming up, one of the Institute's most famous paintings. This is all the deteriorating color, this fugitive zinc yellow that he mixed with other colors. And how researchers revealed clues about why it changed over time. At the Art Institute of Chicago, this is a large painting that's hard to miss. In the 1880s, Georges-Pierre Seurat completed what many consider to be his masterpiece, a Sunday on La Grande Jatte. It's a work of stagecraft with colors that were applied in a very specific way. He wanted it to seem as if the, the sun was coming from the canvas, you know, that when you, when you backed up, you would have this glowing effect. The color he used, this zinc yellow, was what we call fugitive. That means it doesn't stay stable. It's not a color that remains the same colors when you put it on. Seurat didn't know that at the time. That much is well documented. But less understood is why the paint lost its brilliance. Why paint that was originally a luminous yellow became darker and greenish brown. For the Art Institute, the first thing to do was determine the composition of the paint. So we took microscopic samples from Lagrangeat, from the darkened areas of, uh, of yellow and green brush strokes. And so we used that to reverse engineer the paint and be able to replicate the composition of the paint by selecting smaller sets of variables until we replicated the whole composition to then submit to aging and Northwestern. And what we would do then is to age them we, in, in an environmental chamber. Kimberly Gray, an environmental engineer at Northwestern, studied the replicated paint samples. While she doesn't normally do work related to famous paintings, the research concepts were familiar. She needed to find out how various elements in the environment were interacting with elements in the paint. And then what we would do is we would put them in our chamber and we would expose them to light. Then we would select a level of humidity and then we would select a kind of additional pollutant that we thought was very likely to have been a factor in Surratt's day um, when they burned coal. The findings, the change was most likely not caused by humidity, but light exposure and acidity from burning coal were probably major factors. In a very short time, mind you, I mean, the Lagrange Jean, the integrity of that pigment was very poor. That bright yellow um, luminosity of the painting changed within five years. As much as science can tell historians more about the past, it can also be used to better understand the provenance of a work of art. Francesca Casadio, the museum's conservation scientist, is conducting tests on the collection of modern bronze sculptures, including this Matisse and a Picasso. This is one of the tools that we've been using with the metal sculptures. It's an elemental analyzer. It's an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. The spectrometer can indicate the basic contents of a sculpture, but when the Institute needs more precise information, they'll actually drill small pieces of metal from under the base and hand them to Northwestern's David Denan. This is typically the amount of sample that we would take from the sculpture, and uh, this is exactly what we did to give to David to analyze. Thank you. So we have those turnings, a little bit of metal, and the important thing was that this was taken from within the piece. In the lab, Dunand uses a second type of spectrometry, which can come up with a fingerprint so accurate that it has the potential, given a large enough database, to determine what artist and what foundry produced the sculpture. All the Picassos are starting to cluster together. Why is that important? Well, 
we could imagine that it could be used as a forensic tool. If a new sculpture just appears and well, in somebody's attic and say, oh, you know, we found a Picasso, one thing you could check is to say, oh, is the composition similar to the ones we found in pieces that we know are authentic? The science has other applications and can help conservators preserve, even repair, sculpture. If there's a pit, for instance, uh, which is often the case for corrosion, you would want to match in the repair the actual metal, the base metal. Otherwise, you start having more corrosion and your fix is actually making things worse. With all the questions that are raised by this collaborative research, one thing is not in doubt, that the ongoing relationship between the Art Institute and Northwestern is mutually beneficial. For some, it is a marriage of ideas. I think it illustrates that um, uh, art and science are not so different from one another. They're different manifestations of the creative spirit of humankind. For others, it is an opportunity to apply science in a new way. Because of the fact that they're beautiful objects that we're looking at, it's a natural attraction for students to want to study these. And so these objects provide then an opportunity to attract more people to science through art. And for the conservation scientist, it is a way to build a team and answer the many questions posed by great works of art. From our perspective, it was clear from the beginning that it was a win-win situation, I and mean, it's proven even better than our widest dreams.